Alex Medrano, thank you so much for joining us on Highest Aspirations. Good morning. Hi, Steve. Thanks so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. This has been a long time coming. Um, I think maybe it was two years ago when I read the article from Chalkbeat, Colorado. Um, and this happens sometimes, but at the time, it's actually going to work out really well. We were just talking about that right before we started, um, as we have a few episodes that are kind of along a similar topic. So so let's get started. So, so that, as I said, we learned about you through um, an article uh, in Chalkbeat, Colorado, um, that we shared in one of our community briefs. It was really a popular one. And the title was really compelling. It was this Colorado teacher used used to lecture students about using Spanglish in the classroom. Now she embraces it, which is a beautiful story. And I think something that a lot of people can kind of uh, kind of kind of wrap their heads around at this point. And it fits um, really nicely into recent work on elevating the idea of translanguaging, meta bilingual meta linguistic awareness, and and other topics that are just now becoming a lot more widely understood and and really accepted and embraced. So let's start by talking about kind of where you were. You used to lecture your students about using Spanglish. I kind of did too as a foreign language teacher, which is probably even worse. So sorry to all of those students way back a long time ago that I was teaching. But um, but what you know, what did it look like, and what why were you doing it? Yeah, um, honestly, sorry to all my students as well. I actually also started my career in teaching Spanish as what was then called like a foreign language, right? Um, and I also had majored in Spanish. So in my teaching career, this I was fresh out of college, I had majored in Spanish, um, which was from very monolingual curriculum that was focused on either like Spain or Latin America and not on the Latinx experience here in the United States. Um, and when I started teaching Spanish, I was predominantly teaching Spanish to native or heritage speakers, mm -hmm. um, even though it was Spanish two or Spanish three or you know advanced Spanish, whatever it was. Um, and I just remember coming in very much like my high school Spanish teachers did and like my college professors did in terms of like, you only speak Spanish in the classroom. Um, and I had that perspective that Spanglish or translanguaging was incorrect um, and was not utilizing the language like in air quotes correctly. Um, and so I would honestly lecture my students all the time on doing so um, and telling them that words that were derived from English, um, like for example, lonche, which is lunch, you know, yeah. troca, truck, yeah. were incorrect and that we shouldn't be utilizing those in formal situations. Yeah, that resonates so strongly with me. I'm smiling because, well, I, I guess I'm smiling like in an ashamed kind of way because I did this, I did the same exact thing. And what you, you, know, you re what really resonated to me was I walked into the classroom as a Spanish teacher because I also taught Spanish. And when I started teaching Spanish, although I'm not a heritage speaker of Spanish, I was kind of charged with teaching a lot of the heritage speakers that were in the in the city that I was teaching in. And same thing, all different levels. Um, and I also like had that thing where, all right, what do I do? Let me teach like my teachers taught, even though it wasn't extremely effective at the time, most of the time. Um, so it just, it, it resonates. And by the way, words like lonche and troca, it's funny because Lonche is a word that that I, I was the same. I was like, no, it's, it's almuerzo. You know, you don't. It's not lonche. And now I say lonche all the time. Just like I'm about to eat lunch at home, I say to my wife, I'm gonna have lonche now. <laughs> As I think about, oh, I'm translanguaging. That's great. I mean, a hundred percent. And what I think like gets me so much about the way that I I started my teaching career was that I was perpetuating, um, as perpetuating things that occurred in my own educational experience. Like I am a heritage. Spanish speaker. I grew up speaking Spanish at home, English at school. And I remember being a student in a classroom and being told that words, you know, um, Spanglish words weren't correct. And I, I mean, even my own grandparents would make fun of the way that I would speak Spanish. And I think it's, um, I think now I do so much work in like validating that that is the, our experience here as first, second generation Spanish speakers in the United States. Um, but at the time, that was not where I was coming from. And it was just, I mean, looking back at me now, again, like, sorry to all my former students, because mm. I'm like, man, I just did what all my teachers essentially did to me, you know. <laughs> but you, but as we yeah. do, as we move on, as good teachers do, you saw something, uh, something happened, and you changed your practice, which I think is where a lot of people are now. They sort of understand this. They're hearing podcast episodes or they're reading about or they're hearing the work of Dr. Medina and others. So my next question is, wh what was it that made you change your mind about the language repertoires that students were bringing into the classroom? And then how did you go about shifting your practice to support them? Because it's one thing to change your mind. 
There's another thing to shift. That's harder. Yeah. I mean, the first thing, and this is kind of a funny story, but the first thing that made me change my mind is that when I started teaching upper levels of Spanish, I wanted to make sure that students had um, primary sources and articles from Spanish news sites. And so this whole class was confused on this word mitin, M-I-T-I-N. <laughs> and we looked it up. Um, we read it in context. And finally, like it dawned on me that this was what I was calling at the time an anglicismo. So like a word that was derived from English that came from meeting. And so instead of saying like reunion is like meeting. And my students, because this is the same students that I would lecture all the time, were like, no, Missy, it's okay. Like, <laughs> like they do it in news articles. And I was like, wow, like you all are right. And so that was like the first little light bulb moment. And that was like a funny story. But really over the years, I just saw my students truly like shut down. Mm. Um, as I was telling them that the way that they speak Spanish is wrong or incorrect, right? Um, Cause this is the way their parents say it, their grandparents say it. And so I think seeing my students shut down like that obviously had a very deep effect on me. And mm -hmm. as a teacher, as an educator, I wanted to make sure that my students were feeling validated in the classroom, not that their um, linguistic repertoires or that their identities um, you know, were trying to be suppressed. Um, and so as I shifted towards teaching in more Spanish for heritage and native speakers, and then just having more Spanish um, heritage speakers in my cl classes, I realized that I really wanted to focus on that identity and like building their multilingualism as an asset um, and wanted to really build them up rather than tearing them down. Um, and so a lot of that was researching on my own first, you know, what are the sorts of activities that you can um, that you can do in class that build identities and build pride in being a multilingual student. Um, and then also just normalizing translanguaging and Spanglish in the classroom and allowing students to use both English and Spanish. Um, really, I noticed boosted up engagement and made students more excited to be in my class. Um, and from there on, things only got better because I was, became more and more curious about language acquisition and like translanguaging all of those things. Yeah, a couple a couple takeaways there. There's 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 two main kind of takeaways that I have, and that is one, like the telltale sign is the is the students and the engagement that you have in your class. Like you see that in their eyes, you see that in the way that the class is run. And I think, you know, most teachers, that's kind of what they're most. Um, that's kind of what makes them change the most. And then the other piece is the research. So when the research proves that. Yes, like when you do these things, it's not only putting a smile on students' faces, but it's also helping them in so many different ways. Um, that's when you know you're on the right track. So good for you for, for doing both of those things. And, you know, transitioning to my next question, and I've mentioned Dr. Jose Medina a couple of times. He was actually on the episode right before this one. We kind of put them together on purpose. He, he would have called both you and I, or would call the, the, the past you and I, language oppressors. Um, so when those students shut down, what we were doing was we were we were not allowing them to kind of fulfill what they needed in order to be, you know, a, a, an asset in our in our class. Um, and so and so you're clearly now putting a lot of his recommendations and research into practice. One thing that he cautions uh, educators to avoid is becoming this thing, this language oppressor, even if they're doing so unintentionally, which I think both of us were. Um, <clears throat> But how have the, the changes you've made helped you and perhaps your colleagues become not only like a better teacher, but more a better advocate for your students and even help, again, like Dr. Medina says, when you're lesson planning, you're lesson planning to promote social justice or to become an oppressor. So how are you, do you feel like you're doing those things now with uh, the changes that you've made and how are you going about doing them? I'd like to think that I am most definitely going in the right direction. <laughs> um, um, I truly plan with equity and social justice in mind when it comes to unit planning, lesson planning, being an advocate for my students. Um, I try and take my own educational experiences and background, and then those of the students that I've taught my own experiences in the classroom um, to move forward and advocate for them. But I think like truly let's start with the fact that providing a quality education that supports all learners, students of color, students with disabilities and multilingual learners, that is social justice. Mm -hmm. um, because it's undoing a system that for so long upheld white monolinguistic culture and values and that truly only supported um, 
those white monolinguistic students to achieve and very few students in between, right? Mm -hmm. That might've like found the way I think of myself, like I found the way to you figured it out. To be successful. I figured it out. I yep. learned how to play the, gl- the game. I got into AP and honors classes as a high schooler. Um, and I feel like a lot, I, I lost a bit of my identity along the way that wasn't yeah. always valued in classes. Um, and for the majority of the peers of my peers who maybe sound look like me and have similar backgrounds, that wasn't always the case. And so creating curriculum that supports all students and empowers them to engage in rigorous material and demonstrate their brilliance, like that is social justice. Um, and not allowing students to utilize their full linguistic repertoire or cultural repertoire, like that is what is oppressive. And I think like changing our classroom environment and using techniques that develops all students and gives all students access has allowed our students to grow and obtain the education that they deserve. Like I think of, for example, I co-teach um, in a U.S. history classroom, and I think of class debates and Socratic mm-hmm. seminars that were often reserved just for AP students. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that is such an engaging way to learn. And um, it really causes students to think of like cause and effects and how something in history changes our, Mm. you know, our day to day life. And that could potentially be not very supportive of our all our learners. So we need to include supports, whether it's like language stems, a conversation pattern techniques to allow all of our students to engage in activities like Socratic seminars and class debates. um, Because then all students really have that opportunity to engage in, and engage in activities that's going to help them grow and participate um, and have a much better experience in the classroom. Yeah. And you've used the word engaging and engage a few times. And I think that's absolutely right. I, I would add mm-hmm. that's also those kinds of activities are empowering for students, right? Yeah. And then we need to be able to do that. Um, do you think so? Like talking about co-teaching um, and like your colleagues, I think most teachers are really comfortable with content and like content supports and planning for that. Do you think most educators though understand kind of the power they have to advocate for their students through those language and culture supports? Um, I'd be interested in, in yes or no. And, and, but then I'd, I'd be interested to hear, you know, you said you're on the right, you're on the path. We're always, a, we're a work in progress. We're not going to be there right away. So what do they need, uh, to either get on that path or, or to improve. Just curious what your observations are. And I know I'm not asking you to throw anybody on the bus under the bus. We're all doing the best we can in, in a very, very difficult job. So I hope that that question doesn't come across that way. No, and I want to start with that. Like, I know that all the educators that I've worked with and in my current school building that like, we want to do what's best for our students. Um, and they care and often, you know, advocate in their own ways for their multilingual students. But I think you're correct that teachers are very comfortable with the content. Um, and I don't think that they always understand the power that they have in um, shifting practices in their classroom and shifting like the language, the curriculum, support that they implement in their classroom to really empower all of our students and particularly multilingual learners. Um, I think for me, that is like the focus and the passion for the content, but then also like realizing that the the focus for so long in education was acquiring and developing English rather than celebrating um, multilingualism as an asset. And I think also teachers can do a good job, I think, like teaching the content vocabulary oftentimes and things that are necessary for their content. So I think the missing piece for me are something that's called like a content language objective. And so realizing what is it in their lesson, what language are they implicitly using, not explicitly teaching that might not be related to the content that's going to give their students um, access and then also not just access, but development and like use of of the content and like interacting with it and, and being able to use it outside of the classroom. Yeah, that's the key, right? To be able to have like the language kind of unlocks the, the, the content. And I think, I think I heard you kind of get into the the academic language piece a little bit where I think it's a slippery slope, you know, and, and, and this is kind of here. I'm coming from an organization that, you know, one of our, one of our products is, is specifically for making sure that students have the academic language necessary to succeed in math classes. And that's so extremely important, but we are, we as an organization, and I think we as a community, and I would consider you a part of that community, don't believe that that should come at the expense of the student's home language and cultures and experiences that they bring to the table. 
So kind of a follow up question about that. I, I just I can't help but think about this. Like, how do you how do you, um, you know, when when you're kind of approaching this on a day to day basis, ensure that you're not only giving students the language in English that they need to access the content, but allowing them really to take advantage of their kind of the home languages they're bringing or just social language. I mean, there's so much to it. It's not just a dichotomy between home language and English, right? There's a lot of different layers. So how do you incorporate those in? Is that something that you deliberately have to do? Does that come naturally? How does that work? I think that is definitely something that, that teachers and I myself deliberately do, right? I take a look at my classroom, who's in my classroom, um, what backgrounds might they be, you know, what background, what, um, what prior knowledge might they have? And I think it's really important to activate that and utilize that in the classroom. And I think that's in part like building a classroom environment that that is encouraging of all languages, whether it's, I mean, it could be as simple as like what you're putting up on the wall, right? But also just like the language that you're using, whether it's like posters in different language, different languages or allowing students to maybe do turn and talks in, um, in whatever language, you know, that is best for them. Uh, I also, I mean, I think you're right that it starts with like the classroom environment. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of what else, but I think it is very, very purposeful in how you shape your classroom environment and then how you shape your lessons. Um, because we can't just continue giving the standard lessons and units that we've been giving for years that have not been accessible to the majority of our students and not just from a, a linguistic aspect, but from a cultural aspect mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would imagine the more that you kind of plan this stuff and kind of steep yourself in the research, the more you develop kind of a muscle memory to be able to make changes in the moment, which is such a crucial part of teaching. I mean, you can plan <laughs> we've all received or, or created a syllabus that went out the window in two weeks, right? It's because there were teachable moments or a pandemic or whatever the case may be. Um, Okay. I want to, I want to, thanks for that. That was kind of a little bit, um, a little bit of a curveball, but um, I'm glad you're able to, to, to provide some, some information on that. So I want to circle back to co-teaching because it's something that we talk about. We've talked about for a while now. I'm curious as to how that experience um, helped shift mindsets on how to support multilingual learners and maybe what have been some of the challenges you've experienced, because a lot of people have an experience co-teaching. Some of them are kind of intimidated by it. And I think you add like, now we're going to make sure that we do co-teaching that supports multilingual learners and people get concerned that they won't be able to do it right. They have to work with someone else. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. I think that co-teaching has been the most valuable experience that I've <laughs> had as an educator. And I think everyone should have a co-teacher. And I will admit that it was definitely very intimidating at first after years of having my own classroom and being, you know, in control of your own space. Um, but there is something truly magical when you are sharing lesson plans, co-planning with someone. Mm -hmm. um, it allows for a lot of innovation in the classroom. And it, gives, it gave me a lot of courage to try things that one may not do um, if you're the only one. You know, whether it's like pulling small groups or, you know, taking turns teaching parts of a lesson. Um, I also think that oftentimes having someone else in the room to just clarify certain things. Like I, there's been so many moments where I've posed a clarifying question to my co-teacher, you know, as a student, you know, like, oh, so can you explain that a little bit again after seeing kind of where my students and how they're reacting to the material. Um, but I think it also does wonders in, in shifting mindsets. And this is something that we had started um, when I, when we started our multilingual education program here on campus, we started it through the co-teaching. Um, and I think it's so much more powerful than a pullout model um, because our students are integrated into the classroom and it shifts that mindset from multilingual learners being your students or, or the multilingual you know, teacher being those, just the sole responsibility of those teachers to, mm -hmm. it, to these students being our students yeah. you know, and being integrated in our community. Um, and it really helped to shift kind of what we were talking about earlier in terms of like, we need to explicitly plan for these students and that makes the lessons better for all students. Yeah. And I think you, you know, so many, I would encourage people who are thinking about this topic to go back, you know, two minutes or so and listen to that again, because you have some really good points. And I think the foundation of all that is trust, right? Like when you, 
work with somebody that you trust and that you and that understands you and understands your students, you can kind of bounce ideas off each other, being a little bit more vulnerable. I think as teachers, particularly if we've been doing it for a long time, you know, we can get used to our little silos and our kind of comfort zone, but it's like anything else. As soon as you get out of your comfort zone and take a bit of a risk, even though this isn't much of a risk, that's when the innovation happens. So um, that's great. So I, I just kind of was mentioning just now, like the idea of like teachers having taught for a long time. And we have, I was certainly one of them. I taught high school for 17 years before shifting over and, and coming to elevation. And, you know, one of the things that I had to constantly try to remind myself to do is kind of reinvent myself and, and, and seek out PD that was good for me because my teacher preparation program, frankly, and I did it in the middle of teaching, um, was, was, was not great. Um, and your experience was, it seems like it was different. I know you went to the University of Colorado at Boulder. I've heard great things about that program. Got a master's degree in educational equity and cultural diversity. And you credit that program with helping you appreciate the power of language and culturally sustaining pedagogy. Of course, you've seen that. The results in your, in your class, I'm sure it's a variety of things. But for me and for many others, this is not an experience that people had in their teacher preparation programs. So I'd love to hear more about that program um, and maybe offer some advice to teachers who are looking to learn more um, about supporting their multilingual learners. And even if you're so inclined, I'd love to hear about like what other teacher preparation programs can do to make sure that they're reaching teachers who are going to be working with these students and they should be like you excited to be able to work with, with students um, who, who come to the table with lots of different languages and cultural uh, repertoires. Yeah, I mean, I think first I felt so, so lucky to have stumbled upon that, that program and I did it purposeful when I was researching CU Boulder, the Bueno Center, um, and I felt lucky to have professors that had been like doing the research on dual language um, and like it been in the movement for dual language and multilingual education and culturally responsive education. So I think that played a huge part, but it's also just like the structuring of the program. It began with a bit more like theory and pedagogy on like demonstrating the power of language and its ties to student identity and like the privileges of speaking a language a certain way over another and so that really caused me to reflect first um and that's where what i had been feeling in the classroom i also i taught for four years and then entered this master's program um, i think that's I, a great i think that's a great thing by the way even though it's hard to do i sorry to interrupt but like that is so valuable to have done it for a little while and then anyway sorry food for thought <laughs> honestly no great I, it was so impactful because you come in with a foundation of how you've been doing things and a foundation of like what you've learned along the way because kind of how we had chatted about previously I had already started thinking about how I was essentially a linguistic oppressor without having that language or without um understanding what trend languaging not knowing the research behind it like I had started to google some things but then like sitting down again and, and learning the pedagogy behind it and then the research behind language acquisition just absolutely blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And it allowed me to instantly change things in my classroom. Um, so it was very theoretical, but at the same time, trickle down into tech techniques that I was able to immediately utilize in terms of like assessment, um, in terms of like techniques in the classroom and just like affirming what I already knew that we need to implement culturally sustaining practices in our classroom. And it gave me language, honestly, the best thing out of all of it is that it gave me language to advocate for my students yeah. um, and then take that and bring it to my campus. Um, yeah, and so the advice that I would give other educators is to seek those opportunities for professional development, whether it's a master's or um, I think there's a lot of webinars nowadays. I mean, so many opportunities. Um, and, you know, take some time to research, read books, things like that, um, to be able to implement some of these small changes in your classroom that actually really have a very large impact. Um, in terms of teacher preparation programs and what they need to do and, and the shifts that need to happen is first recognizing the power of language and whether it does, you know, it, and it's ties to identity and the privilege that you, that folks have when they're speaking, speaking language a specific way. Like I, something that I thought of was the privilege of not having an accent, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, or the privilege of, you know, knowing formal English or formal version of a specific language and that 
power that it gives a person um, and how you can really affect students' identities by diminishing the way that they speak a language um, and by not celebrating their own experiences that they bring into the classroom. Yeah, and I think that advice would extend to program some programs that are you know, I, I got a master's of arts in teaching Spanish. That was my first master's degree. And then I got one that with totally different technology, innovation and education. Um, <clears throat> but even in that master's of arts of teaching Spanish, I don't remember, this was a long time ago, um, but I don't remember, you know, doing any work about sort of empowering students. It was more about, it was more about the formality, you know, understanding academic Spanish and how in, in that it's just, Anyway, it was gonna. I was kind of the opposite, you know, because I learned Spanish and some Spanish in high school, and then I went. I did go to Spain, lived in Spain, and my biggest regret going there was like I can't. I have no social language, like that. That has some capital too when you're 20 years old and you want to like, you know. And I didn't have it. I had the kind of formal Spanish, but I didn't have certainly any specialized vocabulary. Anyway, getting off track a little bit here. I think no. I'm um, Going off of that, I think I do think that a lot of programs are shifting. Like I think there's a silver lining. I know here in Colorado and in Denver specifically, um, teacher prep programs are required to give like the culturally and linguistically diverse um, certification. So teachers do need to give a certain or need to take, excuse me, a certain amount of classes on how to um, to support their multilingual learners. I just hope and I would think that they do, that they're, it's not just from that lens of acquiring the language and more of, of celebrating multiple languages as an asset. Yeah, I think you're right. I do think I, things are shifting. Sorry. I agree. No, no, that's okay. I think that's good. I, I'm glad you brought it up. I think that, I think that's definitely happening. I guess the reason that I bring it up is because I think there are a lot of teachers like me who are kind of in the middle of their careers or perhaps later in their careers that won't have the opportunity to or the desire, perhaps, or the ability, really, to go back and get another master's degree. So they have to seek out that PD, or that PD, more importantly, has to be brought to them, right, by school. It's just such a, it's just like, it's a grassroots thing. You can do it yourself if you're motivated to do it. If you something happens, like happened with you, like, oh, what am I doing? But then there's like, all right, how does school leadership bring in high quality PD that's going to resonate, um, which is a whole other topic for another time, but part of this conversation, um, for sure. <laughs> All right. So as we kind of begin to wrap up here, I'm going to, I want to ask you a question that I also asked Dr. Medina, because I think it's so interesting that like, he's doing the research part of it. You're like a, like a, like a use case of like, what is what he's kind of, uh, and many others are trying to advocate for. So when I, when I spoke with him, um, we discussed his recommendations to facilitate meaningful change. And those recommendations in his kind of latest article are self-reflection, willingness to learn and unlearn, empowering the student and continuous tenacity and engagement. So I asked him and he, I'll be honest, he kind of like took a, a bit of a circuitous road around this and, and tricked me into kind of getting into all of them, um, which, which you can do as well. But I'd love for you to choose one of those recommendations and tell us why it's so important in your practice. For me personally, I won't go into all of them, but I do agree that all of them are very important and play their own parts um, sure. in being an educator. Um, but I think that for me, what's most important is that willingness to learn and unlearn coupled with that self-reflection is key to my practice because I was educated here in the United States by a system that I would say is, is flawed and meant to oppress people of color, multilingual students. Um, and I've you know, had my own experiences with that and they've made me into who I am and, and into who I am today and the biases that I carry. And so I know that I have a lot of those biases to unlearn. And that's why, you know, I, I said, I, I hope I'm going in the right direction. I know I'm going in the right direction because I've taken the time to pause and reflect on the way that I was taught and what I know of the world around me because of the way that I was taught um, and my own experiences and how I view the world. And then going out of my way to, to seek to learn and it doesn't need to come from a formal setting or professional development. I, I love to learn. So that's the way that I'm going to do it. I'm constantly going to conferences <laughs> and learning more. I'm such a, you know, a nerd in that sense, but I, you learn from your students. I can relate. I can relate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you learn from your students and, and that's where I think, you know, draws back to that like funny story about me is like, they taught me like, Hey, this is actually okay. And they tease me about it. 
but I learned so much from my kids. Um, and I think it's important to, to respect and want to empower your students and acknowledge that education is and should be dynamic. And you've got to constantly be learning and unlearning because that's the best way to support our kids. Yeah, that's great. I kind of want to wrap it up there because that's so powerful, but I have one more question for you that I bet is going to be just as powerful. Um, so in that, in that Chalkbeat article that, uh, that I referenced, um, you, you referenced a quote from Rita Pearson's TED Talk, and she said, every kid needs a champion, which I think is beautiful. Um, I think I know why it resonated with you, but you can feel free to tell us. But my most, most important part of the question is, what steps do you think we should be taking to make sure that becomes a reality for every student in our in our schools? Yeah, I think that being our students champions, like that is part of the job. Um, and not all students come in with that academic confidence and it's our responsibility to build that confidence um, throughout the year by supporting our students and giving them like what they need to be successful. But my biggest advice there is, is to take the time to build the relationships. Mm. Um, that is my favorite part of teaching. I, you know, been in the classroom for 10 years now and I love learning about my kids and getting to, to know them on a bit more of a personal level, but also so that I can integrate that into our classroom um, and activate their own prior knowledge, connecting the curriculum to their cultures um, and utilizing language that's affirming of students and their identities. And I think that's how we can truly be their champions. Yeah, it's a hundred percent true. This, this, this idea of relationship building, I think has gotten rightly so a lot more attention over the course of the pandemic as we haven't been able to see students face to face and it's become even more important or I guess not now, but you know, a year ago, two years ago. Um, and, and you know what I'll say too, is like that relationship building piece with students transcends to everything else in life. Like the ability to establish and nurture a relationship with somebody and understand who they are as a person and what they bring to the table is not only something that a teacher should learn about their students, but it's something I think that a student should learn from their teacher setting that example so that they can do the same thing moving forward in whatever path they choose. And that's not something you can put on a resume, but it's certainly something that when we have an interview with somebody or you start to work with somebody, boy, you see that right away. And that person is, has, a, has a good chance of being successful. And I think if a student is in a situation where the, the example is not being set that a relationship is being established and nurtured by my teacher and by others, the community, then they won't learn that. So I just think, I don't know, I, 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 any reaction there I'd be interested in, but I think that's like a cycle, right? Yeah, I would agree. It's, it's, it's definitely a cycle and it creates a community. And that's the important piece there, right? We want to create a community in a classroom, in a school, um, and teach students to create that community outside of our walls um, to continue to create positive change. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so we come full circle. So I now I have a, now I have two more questions for you. One, I ask everybody that comes on the podcast. I, it's a kind of a selfish question because I love to have a list of books to read, but hopefully it helps others as well. We actually just released our summer reading list, which comes from, uh, and it's hard to believe we're, our summer is almost already over. Um, but with that comes from all our guests. So I'm going to ask you: Is there a book or any other resource that's influenced you either personally or professionally that you'd like to share with listeners? Yeah, I have, I have two, and one. Um is Gloria and Zaldua's How to Tame a Wild Tongue. Um, that was the first time that I truly felt seen in an academic text. Um, and it truly demonstrates the ties between identity and language. And I actually showed, you know, we read that as a staff. I brought it to my staff last year. And a lot of folks told me that it gave them a little bit of a light bulb. And it was a light bulb for me when I read that text, um, How to Tame a Wild Tongue, because I saw myself so much in it. Um, and then secondly, Django Paris's Culturally Sustaining Pedagogy. Um, I love the piece of sustaining rather than maybe mm -hmm. responsive um, because it shows that our duty is not just to respond to a student's culture or, or use it to make learning relevant, but it's to encourage that they keep and continue developing their cultures. Yeah, it's funny. I, I was using the word culturally responsive or the expression culturally responsive for a long time and I've just begun sort of shifting that and it feels feels so much better sustaining. And I'm kind of like now like auditing everything and thinking, where can we replace responsive with sustaining and put it in there? Because I think it's such a beautiful thing. And words matter, you know, they really do, um, the way that we're describing things. Okay, last question, Alex, and that is, um, is there a way that people can kind of learn more about the work you're doing? I'll link to that Chalkbeat article um, because I think it's really compelling and interesting for people that want to read, but any other way people can either learn or get in touch? 
yeah, I'm definitely on social media. Um, so I encourage you to find me, Alexandra Medrano, on LinkedIn um, or on Twitter. Um, those, I would say, are the two ways that I kind of post more professionally about my work. Great. Well, Alex, it's been a long time coming, but it was worth the wait. Um, such a pleasure to chat with you and, and hear your story. I, I'm hoping that uh, that people are hearing kind of themselves and your story. And if they're not hearing themselves, maybe they're motivated to kind of um, take that next step. I think that's what we try to do. We don't look at this podcast as, as professional development, but it's the inspiration to get you to the place where you need to go. So thank you for being part of that journey. Thank you, Steve.